Hello, everyone, and welcome. We're glad that you can join us today in our part two of Engaging Indigenous Leadership in Climate and Disaster Resilience. I'm Don Knickerbocker. I belong to the Anishinaabe people from White Earth Nation called Gawabagenikag in our language, enrolled in the Minnesota Chippewa tribe from the Otter Tail Pillage Band of Indians. I currently reside on the traditional homelands of the Shawnee and the Miami people, known as present-day Yellow Springs, Ohio. I'm the Vice President of Development and External Engagement for Native Americans in Philanthropy, and I'm so excited to be a part of uh, this uh, group today and all the work that they have put together to bring you this incredible content. Um, as um, always, um, when we're engaging with each other on these topics, it's really important to start um, this kind of event with an acknowledgement of whose land we're on. So please join me as we take a moment and bring our attention to the environment that we're in and the land that you are occupying. I know that we come from all over today and really plant your feet into the ground wherever you are, wherever you physically are. This land is sacred and it's our responsibility to take care of it, not just for ourselves, but for future generations. Wherever you may be, you are in a place of rich culture, gathering and ceremony, food growing. And because it is winter, we are in the time of story and remembrance. And we can never separate the people from the land, and this land longs for its people. Join me as we acknowledge the homeland of the good and many peoples from Turtle Island. Um, please put uh, wherever you are in the chat, if you can. Um, and I ask that you acknowledge these communities, their elders, past, present, as well as future generations. And because today we are talking about climate and disaster resilience, and also the role that Indigenous leadership plays, I also offer commitments for today. In this virtual space, we are committed to the process of working to dismantle the ongoing legacies of settler colonialism. We acknowledge on this day that philanthropy was founded on the exclusion and erasure of indigenous knowledge about how to care for our lands and how to steward wealth. And we're obligated to support and educate each other with accurate information about the true history of this land. And finally, we are committing ourselves to the truth of where and how uh, we can protect and defend Mother Earth. So as people here now on this land, we are going to do what we can to provide each other uh, with a new way forward. So I'd like to now turn it over uh, to Danielle, who can talk a little bit about logistics. Thank you, Don. Hi, everybody. Um, thanks for that warm welcome. Uh, my name is Danielle Crystal. My pronouns are she, her, and I am the Director of Membership at Philanthropy Northwest. I'm joining today from the traditional land of the first people of Seattle, the Duwamish people. Um, this series is the product of the tremendous thought partnership and planning by all of our hosts, and I want to extend an appreciation to all of them, including the Center for Disaster Philanthropy, grant makers of Oregon and Southwest Washington, Groundworks New Mexico, Native Americans in Philanthropy, Northern California grant makers, Philanthropy California, Philanthropy Colorado, and Smart Growth California, an initiative of the Funders Network. All of us as philanthropy serving organizations have come together over the last several months in response to yet another devastating wildfire season and specifically how tribal people are consist consistently disproportionately impacted. And we really wanted to bring attention to the philanthropic community around not, how not just wildfires, but also how climate change intersects with tribal histories, sovereignty, land and water, cultures and health and socioeconomic well-being and how funders can meaningfully and respectfully engage with indigenous leadership in climate and disaster resilience. This discussion is being recorded and will be shared to all of our registrants. This is part two, as you all, most of you know, of our two-part series. So thanks for coming back to join us. And if this is your first time with us, welcome. 
Um, the first part of this today's session will be moderated Q&A with our amazing guest speakers. And following that, we will have the opportunity to join breakouts with each of the speakers to dig a bit deeper and to engage in small group conversations. So we encourage all of you to stick around and participate in all of those. Uh, we'll, we'll come back together and close out as a larger group and share closing remarks as well as resources for all of you. So I want to thank uh, I want to thank Don and Greg for, from Native Americans in Philanthropy for moderating today's session. And I'll turn the mic back over to you, Don, to get us started and to provide additional context, context and get us going. Thank you so much, Danielle. It's so great to be here in this space. Yeah, so we are in part two. Um, on November 16th, we had part one. You, you need not not be at part one in order to fully engage with part two. Um, part one um, was really some level setting about this conversation. And we really felt that each of these discussions deserved time and understanding. Uh, because we're diving into some very serious cultural issues. Uh, we needed people to show up with their, their full hearts as well as their minds. So during that time on November 16th, uh, we had a fantastic conversation where we talked about important and relevant information. Uh, we had a guest, um, from Seeding Justice, C. Autumn, and she discussed the distinction between Native people and tribal members, um, that we are the first philanthropists and the first people of this land. We gave some historical context. We talked briefly about how tribal access to philanthropic funding has um, impacted Native people. And we also talked about the very important distinction that Native people are often grouped solely into a racial or ethnic category when in fact we have a distinct uh, political relationship with the U.S. government that gives us many different levels and layers of power and access to steward the lands that we all occupy. Um, there's recently been uh, several different governmental um, initiatives around pools of funding like Justice 40, 30 by 30, or America the Beautiful. Um, even the Housing Authority has funding designated for um, Native people. And we briefly discussed how these new programs can either enable or um, erode the rights of Native people and how we we aren't necessarily able to access full areas of these funding and how philanthropy might be able to engage. After that discussion, we, we heard from Regis Picos, a tribal leader, uh, Geneva Wiki from the California Endowment, Joel Moffitt from Native Americans in Philanthropy and from the Nez Perce Tribe, and Lewis Gordon from Seventh Generation Fund. And we talked about Native values in the context of land and water and protection. Finally, in that very short hour, <laughs> we engaged in a rich conversation about philanthropy's um, deepening of their commitment to um, all that were meant to create space and, and where people can recognize themselves. And our focus was really on shifting minds um, and philanthropy's roles in, uh, in this work. So I'd like to um, just acknowledge uh, the power in that first meeting. I think everyone uh, came away with um, a rich idea of where we can go from here. So um, now I'd like to us for us to move forward into our uh, part two. So I'd like to uh, introduce you to our first speaker of today. This is Carla Fredericks. Carla, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Um, thank you for having me. And I'm really uh, dismayed that I missed part one of the session. So I appreciate your open heartedness and in, um, inviting me here. Uh, my name is Carla Fredericks. I'm the CEO of the Christensen Fund. Um, I'm also an enrolled tribal member in the Mandan Hidatsa and Arikara Nation in North Dakota. 
Um, I've been a lawyer for over 20 years now. Um, that's really my identity. I am new to the CEO philanthropic identity, but um, in the last year, I we've really worked hard to operationalize our purpose at Christensen Fund, which is unqualified support for the rights, um, dignity, and self-determination of people. Thank you so much, Carla, for being here. We want you to be here so we can really level set and we can um, take a look at philanthropy in the larger landscape and how um, our climate crisis is impacting us and how Indigenous people are at the leadership role right now. Um, I know you recently went to uh, POP26, and I'm wondering if you could tell us about some of your takeaways as they relate to the resilience of Indigenous communities. Yeah, um, it's a great question. I think that um, one of the things that people don't really internalize about Indigenous people is that because um, of our strong um, commitment to resilience, we're we're really optimistic as um, as a people and how we step through our work. And it's an interesting thing to be in a time that is filled with so much. Um, pessimism and so little connection to one another, um, to be an indigenous person um, in, in a global policy dialogue that also is, is not really, as you said earlier about philanthropy, not really um, attuned to um, the concerns of indigenous people as part of its reason for being. And I think that, um, you know, one thing that really, uh, made me feel really strongly about indigenous leadership being centered at the at the COP is that there would be no COP if it weren't for indigenous peoples. And, and I don't know if you talked about that in the first sec session or not, but um, it was really out of um, the Rio um, summit 30 years ago where indigenous peoples are the ones that stood up and said, we need to do something here. Um, we've got a really dire situation on our hands. And as a result, um, the COP was, was born um, into these international processes and um, indigenous peoples are one of the core constituencies of the, of the COP, um, of which there's only six. And so um, I think that, uh, you know, my experience there was um, framed from a very um, hopeful point of view. And I, it was interesting to, to experience um, being there in that way and then come to also be watching the news um, as I was there and to come home to people asking me about it and having, I think, their own sense of how things went um, from, from what was out there in the, in the media, both social and traditional media. So what I really saw there was um, not just Indigenous power building, but really um, harnessing the power that's been built over three decades. Um, I spent a lot of time with Fawn Sharp, who um, is the president of National Congress of American Indians. She had official delegate status with the United States. Um, that's the first time they've ever done that. Um, and, and it just seemed to me that the inside strategy um, on the climate negotiations for indigenous peoples not just um, from the US presence, but across the board with the UNFCCC and the Indigenous Caucus and other efforts was really strong. Um, and so to come home and have a narrative about kind of this pitiful group of people that were standing outside the gates was really strange. Um, and I just wanna name that for everyone because you know we only see what we see. And I think if we're, social justice and rights-based funders, we are getting a lens on things sometimes. And, and being there, I think there's another lens that um, should be very compelling for funders, that this is self-determination, indigenous um, actualization of their status as sovereign nations in action. And, and that's what we really can support. Right. Oh, well, thank you for that. Yeah, I... Um... I know you wrote a piece for Native Americans in Philanthropy. I'll put the link in the chat um, from the blog that you wrote. It was um, incredibly insightful. Um, and 
we need that perspective from inside of that space. Uh, many of us have re read the news and we heard about the um, $1.7 billion pledge by governments and philanthropy to support indigenous and local community land. Um, it, is, is that enough in your opinion? <laughs> well, definitely it's not enough. Um, you know, I think that, I guess there's a couple of things that I want to say about this. First, um, indigenous peoples didn't certainly create the climate crisis that we find ourselves in. And um, we recognize here that um, efforts to support their response to it are not efforts um, to support indigenous peoples as a tool to solve climate change. And I think that's a very important distinction that I invite everyone to think about. Um, this particular pledge um, was really meant to address a couple of really important issues. Um, for many years, only about 270 million of climate finance has been dedicated to forest protection every year. And out of that, and this is a familiar story, uh, you know, with the work that, that NAP and others have done, indigenous peoples and local communities, so not just indigenous peoples, but local communities, um, however that's defined, that protect the world's forests only receive 46 million of that. So $46 million a year. I know that there are people on this call whose grant making budget exceeds that mm -hmm. to protect the world's forests. Mm -hmm. um, so that that's a huge um, discrepancy in terms of um, the issue at hand and the, and the, and the need that's out there. Um, and we know um, there have been several um, studies done on this that, um, that are just exceptional, that indigenous peoples are the most effective guardians of not only biodiversity, but also forests. Um, and uh, many UN experts came together and urged the climate negotiators at COP to respond with urgency to the destruction of forests in particular um, because of their ability to, um, to deal with um, carbon related issues. And so because of this urgent need to scale up solutions to combat the destruction of forests, um, this pledge came together. And it came together um, really led by the Ford Foundation, um, bringing together the, uh, the bilaterals, to, uh, the countries um, that were signatories to the Paris Agreement and philanthropy um, to further recognize and advance the forest and nature stewardship role of indigenous peoples. And so it's, it's a big number, but in a way to answer your question, Dawn, it's a drop in the bucket compared to what's needed. And actually because philanthropic commitments are commitments um, you know, I think that actually the number is going to be quite higher when we see how um, the philanthropic institutions in particular um, are able to allocate their grant making. I know for us, we're already double for this year on what we thought we were going to do. Um, so there's a lot of need out there. Um, and, and it's also the, the implications um, of the work for everyone are much higher than, than that number um, really uh, is, is connected to. Yeah, I know it, it's impacted the work that we do at Native Americans in philanthropy as well. And I think Greg will speak to that later. Uh, but there's, um, I have one more question for you. Um, there's a growing push and rhetoric within philanthropy to center indigenous voices. What does centering mean and how can individual funders do that? What does it look like from your perspective? So I'm going to try to just keep, keep cool and not get really fired up in response to this question. <laughs> um, so I have spent a lot of my career um, really deeply engaging um, with Indigenous communities to fully actualize their rights. And the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples uh, very explicitly um, provides a roadmap of the rights that Indigenous peoples have as a matter of their humanity. Um, and it is very interesting to me to see a variety of approaches that, um, that choose different language to describe um, what it is they're doing when that instrument is available to everyone 
to look at and see and think about how to to really operationalize indigenous people's human rights as a matter of practice. So whether I'm sitting here or you're sitting here and our voices are centered and people are having the experience of that is kind of like not really the question to me. The question is really how do we operationalize indigenous people's rights in every aspect of what we do? And that means um, you know, really making big shifts within philanthropy to trust in community self-determination to allocate resources as they have determined that they need to for their survival and resilience. And, and centering voices in a, in, a, in a conversation doesn't quite get you there, um, I don't think. I think it's, a, it's perhaps part of it because there has been um, a long history of those voices not being in the room and not being at the table. Um, but, but I think we can all be creative and, and move past that mode of thinking and really um, commit ourselves to, to approaching this through the lens of rights. And I, I guess I would finally offer that this isn't my crazy idea. Um, the, the global consensus is, is that if you transact in money, you have a duty to protect, respect, and remedy human rights. That's the UN guiding principles on business and human rights. And philanthropy transacts in money. And so I don't know what it is that we're doing that makes us think that we are not accountable in the way that we would expect other actors in civil society to be. But I also think that there's an opportunity here for us to be um, the beacon on the hill, so to speak, of accountability and right relationship with indigenous peoples consonant with the UN Declaration. Wow, that's powerful. I love everything that you said. Um, I'm wondering if there are any actions that um, philanthropy needs to take to ensure that tribal communities in particular um, can adapt to climate change effects? Yeah, I mean, I think that there's, you know, I'm an indigenous person, so I don't, I think kind of like in a circle and, and how um, all of this is, is really highly interrelated. So I do think that acknowledgement that tribal communities have the best solutions um, for their communities is really critical. Um, I also think acknowledgement that these communities have a lot of other things on their plate um, is really important and, and allowing the communities to really drive and articulate how they envision this work being carried out. So Cultural Survival did an incredible series on indigenous language um, earlier this year. And one of the key takeaways for me and I've talked to many Indigenous people about this over the years, is that if Indigenous peoples don't have um, access to their language, then their very cosmology and understanding of the world is very, and the universe is disrupted. And I think threading the needle on how, um, how that cosmology connects to climate and land-based solutions is really important for funders. So, you know, indigenous people didn't spring forth out of the womb knowing the name of every plant in the ecosystem, you know, in which they've lived. We have to ensure that we are taking a decolonized approach to funding that which has been um, really purposefully destroyed. And, you know, I think that in these communities, people think very holistically. They think about language, they think about education, they think about our sacred little ones, they think about our elders. And if we kind of zoom in and say, let's talk to your land person, we're that's, that's really not consistent with how, um, how this is going to be successful in these communities. So it's not just a matter of of, um, of best practice or morality or decolonization, but it's also strategic. Um, I think if we think holistically about how to do this work and we listen um, when, when our tribal partners tell us, well, actually what we really need is a language nest, um, I think we're gonna get a lot further um, in, in the objectives that we all share. Yes, yes. Thank you so much. Um, Carla will be sticking around for the interactive part of this, uh, this 
webinar today, or not webinar, but our, our event today. So we're going to switch now to Greg helping us moderate um, and invite some new speakers. Thank you, Don, and uh, thank you, Carla, for sharing those amazing um, words with us and your experience there at COP. And I just so appreciate just your approach and point of view to, um, um, I just really sense the, the, that it's all centered and centralized around our indigenous values and viewpoints and then how we can work out from there um, and just trust um, our people. So thank you so much. Um, for those of you that, that don't know me, uh, my name is Greg Mastin. I'm a member of the Yurok tribe. I'm also a descendant of the Hoopa and the Karuk peoples of Northern California. Um, I currently work uh, for the Native Americans and Philanthropy Organization, and I'm their Vice President of Tribal Nations Engagement and Special Projects. And uh, we have an outstanding group of uh, panelists here to share with you all their work. And this, this segment is really just to share some, some good examples of good work that is, is happening out there. And they'll be able to share with you a little bit about their programs, and what they've learned through those and their engagement um, with our tribal nations. So we have with us today, um, Jenny Quang, um, Alistair Malillan, and Michael Roberts. And so I'm gonna go ahead and let each of the panelists just briefly introduce themselves and maybe just um, briefly say what is um, kind of your, the, the mission of your, your organization and then we'll jump right into the questions. So we'll start with Jenny and we'll go to Alistair and then Michael. So uh, Jenny. Thanks Greg. So my name is Jenny Kwong with the Hewlett Foundation. I developed and managed our wildfire resilience portfolio, which is only a couple years old. Uh, the mission of Hewlett is so big as to be useless to share. So I'll only speak to my little sliver of it from the wildfire portfolio, uh, which is really to help support fire adapted communities and fire resilient landscapes. And elevating indigenous leadership uh, is really one of the key tenants of the wildfire resilience portfolio. Thank you, um, Alistair. I'm Alistair Malolin. Uh, he, his series of pronouns. Um, I'm based in Ohlone territory. I work at Common Council Foundation, but for this webinar, I'm representing Native Voices Rising. Uh, at Common Council, our focus is around community organizing and advocacy. And similarly, at Native Voices Rising, the focus is around Native led organizing and social change efforts. Thank you for being here, Alistair and uh, Michael. Sure. Hi, um, I'm Michael Roberts. I'm with the currently with the Athens Land Trust, uh, based in Athens, Georgia, uh, the original uh, Muscogee Creek Nation. However, I'm actually uh, here uh, to discuss my role and my moonlight role as a philanthropic advisor, uh, working with the California Food Shed Funders in 2020. Uh, the California Food Shed Funders is a um, semi-formal or, or somewhat formal network of uh, funders in that state that are working uh, really at the, the intersection of climate and agriculture. Um, and I helped them navigate uh, from through uh, 2020 some, some disruptions uh, in their relationship with uh, Native community, new allies that they were working on bringing in um, and uh, working in, uh, in introducing the, the shared frameworks for that network of uh, right relationship and regeneration and making sure that definition of regeneration uh, is actually not just a kind of a Western narrowly defined understanding of that term, but actually uh, holds the space and can embrace uh, uh, the understandings of, of the native peoples of, of California and beyond. Mm. Thank you so much, Michael. So we're going to, again, for everybody that's um, new to this or perhaps if they missed the first session, um, we're assuming there's a, a, at least a base understanding of tribal sovereignty and trust obligations and um, the, some of the, the points that Don brought out about uh, it, this is not just a, a race conversation, but that tribes and tribal nations have a, um, an actual political um, uh, power and, and, and relationship uh, with the federal government as, as sovereign nations. And so um, with, with that in mind, we want to move forward and share with you all um, some excellent work that is happening out there in tribal communities. And uh, our panelists are going to share with you uh, some of the things that they learned in engaging um, these tribal uh, nations and communities. So we're going to start. Um, the first question will be for Jenny and Alistair. And um, Jenny, if you could share with us a little bit more 
about the work that you've done that is uh, sort of centers around indigenous climate and disaster resilience solutions and how your organization uh, came into this work and then just maybe some highlights uh, of this work. Thanks, Greg. So I want to say first that so Hewlett is a huge foundation. We have a lot of different pieces that aren't always very good at speaking to one another. So there are several other ways that Hewlett is working with indigenous communities beyond what I do that I am not well versed enough in to speak to. So I will focus on just kind of the, the few pieces of support for indigenous leadership in the wildfire space that my portfolio touches. So the wildfire portfolio is new at Hewlett. We didn't finalize our strategy until November of 2020, and we just wrapped up our second full year of grant making. So it's very much been an exploratory exercise. And I come at this from the perspective of a non-Native person who's new to philanthropy as of joining Hewlett at 20, um, in 2019, and also uh, with a new portfolio and, and trying to figure out where Hewlett is going to, excuse me, <clears throat> fund in the wildfire space. But maybe one piece of relevant background that I wasn't sure um, if it would be useful to share about myself is that I, I do perhaps somewhat randomly have a minor in American Indian Studies from my undergraduate days. So I came into this role with a, a better than average understanding and appreciation, I think, for the role of Indigenous peoples in stewarding our natural resources. So it wasn't a big leap for me once I started really digging into wildfire resilience and what the path forward to wildfire resilience is for the Western United States in particular to see that there was a lot of compelling evidence for indigenous led stewardship and fire management and to really include that in some way as a key part of the wildfire resilience portfolio. And so where we landed with that was uh, really focusing on four <clears throat> sub pieces of wildfire resilience, prescribed burning, indigenous leadership, land use planning and wild and urban interface and just securing additional wildfire resilience funding. So we really kept it as one of four priorities that we wanted to pursue with the portfolio. How we've ended up implementing that is uh, the, the three tribal entities that we currently support under a portfolio. It's small, uh, it's a $2 million a year portfolio and we cover four states and the federal level and we focus on policy advocacy. So we're trying to capture a lot with a small amount of funding. So the indigenous piece of that that we support right now is uh, three tribal entities in California, the Karuk Tribes Department of Natural Resources and Bill Tripp's work in particular, the Yurok Tribes Fire Department in partnership with the Cultural Fire, Manage uh, Fire Management Council, which is a tribal nonprofit that is composed primarily of Yurok tribal members and is working to revitalize cultural fire management. So those are the three concrete pieces that we're supporting. Um, I'll go ahead and pause there. There's a lot more that I could say about that, but uh, can probably leave that to future questions. Okay. Well, no, thank you for, for sharing that. Um, and Alistair, I'm going to rephrase the question a little bit for you because you, you all do so much in your work in supporting um, Native American communities. So maybe could you share some of the highlights of the work that you all do and um, you know, just some, some tips that you might have for people out there that want to learn to engage tribal communities um, in a more meaningful way. Yeah, and maybe I'll start by saying Native Voices Rising is a partnership between Common Council and Native Americans in philanthropy. <laughs> and so I want to note that I'm here representing um, Native Voices Rising, but really with my hat on as Common Council and a non-Native person within the context of that. Um, and so I'll say, you know, at the heart of Native Voices Rising is really, we have 25 community reviewers who are all Native folks and they're the folks making great decisions. Um, and, you know, when we started in 2013, I think we moved just over $200,000 in grants. Um, and this last round was about 2 million. And so we've moved, I mean, <laughs> Jenny mentioned only 2 million, but for us, that's a, that's a big number that we're moving. <laughs> Um, and I think collectively we've moved about 5.5 million um, to Native communities that are working urban-based, rural-based, and reservation-based. And so we're kind of spanning the gamut at all of that. And I'll say our focus has really been around power building and community organizing advocacy efforts. 
And so around this particular topic, you know, I would say about half of our NVR grant partners have a focus on climate environmental work, but actually for most of the, our groups, there's a consistent through line um, to environmental climate disaster relief work, given the intersectional nature of the issues that folks are really dealing with. Um, and so I think Greg wanted me to give <laughs> a little bit of tips. Is it, was that right, Greg? You want me to dive into the tips? Yeah, just maybe share with them. Some of them, are, it's it's so new, just in interacting with uh, Native American communities. So what, yeah, what advice would you have for, for people like them? You know, <laughs> you know, for myself, what I would say is one is like, we came in with a very deep listening stance um, for Native Voices Rising. NVR for us was created when we had our first Native CEO at Common Council Foundation, who was also on the board of Native Americans and Philanthropy, and really wanted to kind of address that the historical under and disinvestment of Native communities, like mm -hmm. <laughs> for the entirety of time. Mm -hmm. um, and I think part of that was really like we created a research report to start it and really figured out like how can bigger funders build trust with Native communities? How can bigger funders find Native communities? And how can Native, how, how can folks actually evaluate Native communities in the way that they're used to funding, <laughs> right? And I think that that was really important for us to have that. And then Native Voices Rising as a grant making pool kind of spawned as a proof of concept trying to figure out how do we actually center those values? Mm -hmm. um, and so for ourselves, what I would name is that, uh, you know, I think we we're really coming in with a trust basis and trying to build deep relationships. So I would say for us, the community reviewers that are part of Native Voices Rising, they're folks who have been grant partners with us for years and years. They're folks who have been within leadership programs at Native Americans and philanthropy for years and years. And so we trust and build relationships with those folks. And I'll say like, as myself, one of the things within Native Voices Rising when I started first attending the review sessions was actually, <laughs> I felt a little challenged because I knew things about groups that weren't written in the applications and had to kind of hold my tongue in terms of bringing that stuff forward. But knowing that actually in our review process, Native folks are the ones making decisions. I would say on the flip side for myself, what I found what I found amazing was actually folks would bring more contextual pieces and on the ground experiences around how these groups are working and what they're doing, how it's connecting to other pieces of work that I as a, as a program officer had no idea of. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah. so I would say the lived experiences and wisdom of folks was really what was really driving the work. And for ourselves as staff members, it was really like, how do we, how are we willing and able to take a step back um, to actually allow and empower folks who have historically been disenfranchised in the philanthropic system? And then the very last thing I'll say around this is, you know, what we can continually hear from our grant partners within Native Voices Rising and our community reviewers is how they really love Native Voices Rising as like a philanthropic intermediary vehicle where they have hated, <laughs> and I don't wanna use necessarily hated, but hated uh, participating in general philanthropic practices writ large, because in many ways in larger philanthropic practices, their boy, Native voices have been marginalized if not erased from the conversation. And the piece that folks really enjoy about Native Voices Rising is actually the decision-making power at the end of the day goes into your hands. We're making the decisions on things that are impacting Native communities across the country. And that's kind of where folks, I would say, find the most amount of value and keep, keep coming back to NBR. Mm -hmm. Very, yeah, the wonderful work that you all are doing there. And I hope everybody is, is listening because Alistair, um, in his comments there, he, he gave you the secret ingredient. So if you're wondering how to successfully work with tribal nations, um, if, if you begin with uh, listening and trust, um, you're going to be a lot more successful. Um, so Michael, the next question uh, will be for you, and we'll also pull um, Jenny into this as well. Um, it, it's similar, but um, this question centers a little bit more around the engagement process. 
Um, so in the work that you you did, what kind of um, you know um, research and, and homework did you all have to do in beginning the process? And then how did you develop it? And then in that engagement process, uh, what did you learn that you can share with everybody today? Sure. Um, uh, thanks for thanks for the question, Greg. Um, and that's a that's a big that, that's a big uh, a big hairy question. I think I might might flip it a little bit because I think the you know really center to this organization, the Food Jet Funders, and I think one of the undercurrents that's that's true across philanthropy, no matter how it dresses itself in metrics, is that it's a relationship driven industry. Um, I, I guess to, is the reality is is that decisions are made on story and they're made on relationship and other forms of data uh, are used to basically justify those decisions or justify, you know, and, and I think that that's the reality across, uh, across the, the, the landscape. And so, you know, one, I, I will say, and I think the, I think the underlying of this is like, do your homework, understand what, you know, what Don, you know, fundamentally underscored of, you know, it's, this isn't, or is it, it isn't, a race conversation, it, or it's not just a race conversation. It is about you know a a a, a, a unique uh, political you know a, a, a politically disembodied community that has rights obligations. And our obligation and as philanthropy is to I I've seen at least a, you know kind of in a uh, my my limited career is my role has been uh, to translate how some of those structures don't mesh with the system and process of philanthropy. Um, and so, you know, on top of doing that homework, it really does begin with relationship and trust um, and, and building relationship. And, and the lessons that, that, that we learned um, around this is you have to kind of live in a, in a tension. So the Fuchet Funders, you know, started informally in 06. Um, it evolved in 2014, formalized as a fiscally sponsored project. And really in 2016 is where the organization or the, the collaborative um, really set its agenda around fellowship and learning, creating a space of trust, creating space to disagree and, and learning and fellowship. Um, and that was what really set the stage for, for how this, you know, kind of the, how the organization and the work with indigenous people evolved um, really in the last, in the last two years. Um, it really literally began with adding a native member to the um, to the circle um, and preparing and the group was not didn't do the homework to prepare for those tensions uh, and continued to try to operate um, based on the kind of core assumptions that had ignored those unique political and cultural histories and that erasure in California in particular. Um, and so it was actually that question of disaster preparedness. Um, that led to a conflagration. Um, it was actually uh, the, the, a, an attempt to learn, go beyond just uh, agriculture as a climate change solution to land management and the role of indigenous people in stewarding the land. Um, that led to, because the homework wasn't done, it, it led to a, um, a falling out. And that was actually, I was, I was brought in uh, as an independent consultant immediately after leaving as a, as a member of the group with a, or after a parental leave <laughs> as a member of the group, um, as a former member of the group to help kind of settle that and, and move things forward. And, and so I was looking through what were some of the, it, not only repairing that relationship, but also like, what are some of the bad habits that philanthropy has um, that, that created that tension in the first place and that, that misunderstanding. Um, and, and, and of those, I think is, uh, and something I want to underscore that, that Carla Frederick said at the top that I think we try to pretend doesn't, isn't real is philanthropy is transactional. The, the tool itself of philanthropy is making financial transactions. And so for all of the conversation around transformational philanthropy and this idea of being transform, transformational or transformative in our work, that's up to you as a program officer or as a trustee or as a consultant to wield that transaction transformationally. And I think we get so caught up in the relationship, we wanna leave the money out of it. So that, that led to, I, I wrote three kind of high level lessons. One, pay for your data. And number two, and related to that is story is data. 
story is incredibly important, uh, you know, and not to, it's very important not to fetishize story and fetishize, you know, kind of Native American culture in that, because as a Southerner myself, a formerly displaced Southerner, story is incredibly important to me. It's, I understand, and I think most of us actually understand the world through story and metaphor, yet at the same time, you know, some of, the, some of us in, uh, you know, in the circle wouldn't bat an eye at paying $150,000 to a consultant to do a landscape meta-analysis or data analysis or a marketing report or a research report, yet we oftentimes will invite native speakers, grassroots speakers, individuals, um, you know, those, those processes that Alistair mentioned that the NVR uh, participants don't hate but don't feel part of is their stories, their data is being extracted from them without any recompense. So pay for your data, stories the data. And another thing I ran into from a practitioner perspective is there's this, this attitude, I think, or this kind of antiquated idea when philanthropy is setting these shared circles that giving money creates some sort of power dynamic. It's like, oh, if we give this person money for their time to come speak with us, now it's a transactional relationship and it's going to create a power dynamic. So then we keep asking and asking and asking of our grantees and partners and prospects uh, before a single dollar is, is shared. The reality is, as we all know, the, the power dynamic is already there. Giving the money before you speak and before you build the relationship is just an attempt to balance that power dynamic. Mm -hmm. We already are sitting in front of that big pile of money. That's, that's there, that big pile of money that, that you as a philanthropic representative are, you know, gatekeeping, whether, you know, what, however aspirational we are about being transformative, that's there whether you exchange the money or not. And so, so actually going out and paying for the, paying for the data, the story and the relationship isn't about, it, it's actually about fixing power dynamics. It's not about that. Um, and the last thing I'll say is the myth of capacity. And this is where I think a lot of, uh, frankly, racism comes into a lot of philanthropy this whole conversation around capacity building, I like why, and why, this is why I love Native Voices Rising, and it turns that upside down, is oftentimes philanthropy thinks it, we are conditioned to look at grantees as supplicants who have a deficit that we fill with our money. The reality is, is the capacity to solve climate change, as Carla also said, is in those communities. It's, it's in the Yurok Nation. The capacity itself, the capacity that we're providing with uh, Native Voices Rising and these other resources is the capacity to navigate a system that is designed to exploit and ex extract and exterminate the voices and cultures of, of the people that we're trying to work with. So when we think about what, what do we mean by building capacity, it's the capacity to navigate an unfair system, not the capacity to do the work. The capacity to do the work is already there. And there's, that's, I think, you know, the first step we have to take when building these relationships to, to shed those bad extractive habits that to, to Carla's point are really failing to uphold the, the human rights of the communities we're working with oftentimes. Mm -hmm. So powerful, Michael, thank you so much. I, I, I love that point that you're bringing out about capacity because I myself have had to have many of those kinds of conversations over my career where people are Kind of politely asking, you know, can can tribes do this, you know? And like my dad's tribe, the Hoopa tribe, you know, they have their own hospital, they have their own police force, they have their own uh, fire department, they have their own tribal court, you know. They do very complex things all the time, and so it's important for funders to realize that, and to um, when they do engage them, to engage them in a true um, partnership from a partnership point of view, and really looking and leaning to the knowledge and wisdom that those communities already have and, and possess. So thank you so much for, for sharing that. And um, I, I, I'm, I could stay there for a long time, but I wanna switch to Jenny here and bring her in on this question. Um, so Jenny, um, so similar to what I asked um, Michael, but so you, you all and uh, Hewlett engaged in this work and what are some of the lessons that you learned in developing that relationship and what advice would you have for um, funders that may be listening right now that are thinking, you know, we, we have this funding, we see the value in engaging um, indigenous communities. 
Um, so what advice would you have for them in developing that based on the work that you all um, did? Yeah, thanks, Greg. A lot of what Alistair and Michael said resonated with me and how I how I view what I can offer in this conversation is like the, the entry level version of if you're a funder that is not yet thinking really transformatively and holistically about how you reorient your structures to be more aligned with supporting indigenous work. Uh, you can learn from Hewlett about how it's incrementally trying to figure out how to work within our existing philanthropic structure to 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 make things more supportive of engaging with indigenous communities in a meaningful way. So I'll, I'll speak first a bit to the, how did we do or how did I do? And I should say, I am not speaking for Hewlett as a whole. This is just my own personal exploration while developing this portfolio of how to engage in the space. Um, so I'll, I'll speak a bit to the, how did I approach relationship building as someone who's just never worked as a philanthropist or really worked with native communities before. And then also the, the what did I learn, especially from the how do you maintain that relationship from the, from the really uh, kind of boring administrative stuff that, that you have to think about to really make that burden as low as possible for the folks that you're working with. So with the engagement, I think what Michael said about being relationship-based is spot on for me of I really relied on relationships to get me to tribal folks whose work uh, could be supported through a wildfire resilience oriented portfolio. I work within the reality that our work is siloed at Hewlett. We have strategies that we have to work within the confines of. And while we can be somewhat creative as program officers about how we work within that, we don't have full reign to, to move outside kind of a certain, uh, certain mode of funding work. And so I, I did my own initial research and learning of what resources are out there around wildfire management and, and tribes. And from that point, tried to connect with folks who have connections with tribes. I, I've never cold emailed or cold called a tribe because I'm very aware of how, of how many things they're juggling simultaneously. And I'm very reluctant to take up anyone's time unless I feel like Hewlett can actually provide some concrete value through a conversation and a touch point with them. So I, I ask nonprofit partners, for example, for introductions to make sure I do my homework and understand to the extent that I can without taking their time directly first, what it is they're doing in the space to make sure there might be enough uh, room for alignment to, to make that touch point. So that's the front end. Um, I think something that's probably really basic that I feel like is important to say for people who have never engaged with tribes before is that you are often, depending on the individual you're speaking with, entering into a very different way of having conversations um, that is often very storytelling based. And for people who have kind of learned through or been cultivated to speak in very what we consider westernized professional, professional terms, you might be a little thrown off by some of the initial conversations we have with tribal folks because they might be communicating in a way that makes you a little bit uncomfortable or confused or feels uh, circuitous. But I think just having the patience to be uncomfortable and to figure out what you can learn from that conversation and what wisdom is coming through from that conversation is really important. Having the patience to have multiple touch points and phone calls to really flush out whether or not there is uh, an intersection that you can really hook onto there is really important. Um, onto the, the what have I learned through the process of maintaining that relationship and trying to be a good grant maker partner. <laughs> I, again, simultaneously learning how to be kind of a regular grant maker alongside trying to figure out how I could work within those confines to be a better grant maker to tribal partners in particular. And I'll just say that I treat my tribal partners differently than I treat my large nonprofit partners. I'm much more flexible. I pay them upfront for their time. If I'm gonna have more than a couple hours of conversation and I don't yet know if there's a potential project idea that I can fund, I'll offer a stipend for their time for talking to me and trying to come up with a project idea, even if it doesn't turn into a project. 
Um, being patient and flexible, the folks that I try to work with on wildfire resilience are often also the ones that have to get called out on fires during fire season. They're the ones working on COVID emergency response. And so I might try to hook up with them in fall and sorry, they're busy fighting fires for the next three months, come back in five months when maybe we have time to talk to you. And so what I do with my funding is for the discretionary pieces that I have, to try to set those aside for tribal uh, work as long as I can until it's absolutely clear that I need to reallocate it to something else. But I try to keep it around and open for the possibility in a way that I wouldn't for other projects. So there is no kind of that use it or lose it mindset that I have with potential tribal uh, grantees where it's, well, it's sometimes this takes time to, to get together and that's okay. and we can keep coming back and picking up the conversation when the time is actually right for you, not when the time, not when the window of opportunity is right mm -hmm. for Hewitt necessarily. Um, other, a, a couple other things I wanted to say. I also don't typically, when we have new grantees, we almost always do short-term, on average a year, one-time project grants to start out before you figure out whether there's, you know, enough of a, of an alignment there that you want to keep continue supporting them in some more unrestricted way. For all three of my tribal grantees, I went immediately to multi-year funding and I went immediately to as unrestricted as possible. So we cannot give uh, GOS funding to tribal governments, but we can give slightly more unrestricted what we call program funding at Hewlett. I don't think that's like an actual philanthropic term, but for us, program funding is just, we have to have it for some specific use, but we can make it as broad as possible. Um, mm -hmm. And then for the, the nonprofit partner, we just went straight to general operating support funding. In, in recognition of you can't, you know, you can't silo wildfire resilience to just their wildfire work. And we want to give them flexibility to work on whatever priorities they actually have. Okay. And then the only right. other thing I'll say is we also have a separate bucket of funding at Hewlett for organizational effectiveness, which is, is our version of capacity building. Um, and I also prioritize my tribal grantees and other smaller nonprofits for accessing that work, which can, can and should be in many ways completely unrelated to their project work. And so they've been th for things like um, developing a, a sustainable food strategy, developing uh, GIS training and software, et cetera. So I'll stop there. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jenny. Uh, yeah, we're getting um, close on time here, but some amazing um, advice you're giving. For the last question, I'm gonna get both Michael and Alistair to weigh in. Uh, you've got about two minutes each, just so you uh, are aware. Um, there's a lot more increased funding right now, uh, both federal dollars that are um, um, being deployed to tribal communities. And so what do you feel um, um, are good strategies to ensure that Native Americans receive an equitable distribution of the funds that are being deployed right now? And, um, and actually more specifically, what actions can philanthropy take right now to make sure um, that those funds, um, that the Native communities are receiving access to those funds and they're being deployed in an equitable manner. So we'll start with uh, Michael and then we'll end with Alistair. And if you can be uh, about two minutes. Oh each. Lord, mm -hmm. this is a, <laughs> um, <laughs> that's a big area question. Um, I will say that the starting point of uh, following that human rights declaration on indigenous rights and making sure that the partners and relationships you have in, uh, in your in, in indigenous communities that you work with, it, you're, you're responsive to what they need. The other piece is, uh, depending on where you are in philanthropy, there's, you are in some level of access to the inside game. And if you don't have relationships with the career bureaucrats, the individuals at the federal level that are actually in charge of the disbursement of that money, start making them now. Frankly, it's a little bit too late. They should have had those relationships so that now when these you know, conflagrations happen, you can actually start to get that relationship and call them. But that is a that is a piece of that is a responsibility. I think that um, it, that change minded philanthropy uh, has, but but underutilizes in a drastic level. Get to know your federal officials, your administrative decision makers, 
you have the ability to do play that translational role to maximize how much funding is going down. And in some cases, set the terms of how those that funding is allocated and dispersed to be more friendly or more accommodating to those grassroots allies on the ground that don't know how to play inside baseball. Yeah, thank you so much, Michael. Um, Alistair, you got a, a minute and a half. <laughs> well, one, I'll just say, if, you, if we're trying to get proportional funding for where the native community population sits based off census numbers, that is not enough. Uh, in order to change the system and change the underlying systems and structures, we need to fund native communities at well above proportional levels <laughs> because of the vast discrepancy in funding that has historically been there. And then, you know, what I would say for non, as a non-native funder, one of the biggest things that I can do is open doors to other non-native funders. Because I think one of the things that's super critical in understanding here is that if we're going to win for native communities, it can't be just one funder uh, thinking that they can go it alone. In order to fund and win, you need an ecosystem of funders all working and supporting groups simultaneously. Um, and the other piece that I'll say is, you know, if you're a bigger funder who has limitations, and I don't want this to sound self-serving, but work through intermediaries. <laughs> intermediaries and not just ourselves, Seventh Generation Fund, First Nations Development Institute, like we're set up to help alleviate some of the burdens that you have as a philanthropic organization and move the money as expeditiously to the ground as possible. I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Alistair. And, and thank you all so much for sharing your expertise and your experiences with us. We're going to transition back now to the next segment of this uh, webinar. So thank you all for joining us today. All right. Thank you. That was really fantastic. Um, just appreciate hearing those different perspectives. And as Danielle said at the top, we're going to have breakout rooms where uh, you have an opportunity to go a little bit deeper with these uh, three funders on their various perspectives, um, as well as talk with uh, a couple others. So what's what's unique, right, is that we heard from an individual who works for a large foundation doing direct grant making through her personal commitment. Um, we also heard from Alistair, who works for an intermediary, and Michael, who worked with a philanthropic collaborative. So three really different types of strategies that you might use to approach your own um, interest in working more directly with indigenous communities. Uh, we also have the opportunity to hear from, if you'd like to go deeper with Carla Fredericks on really this kind of international context and the commitments that are happening and how that's gonna play out in the interactions uh, with tribes. And lastly, um, you have the opportunity to go into a small group with Scott Clow, who's with the Oot Mountain Oot Tribe. You didn't hear from him in our panel, um, but he's uh, helping, uh, he's participating in some really great renewable energy work um, in Colorado. So I'd like to invite Scott to actually share right now, just a couple minutes. So since you weren't able to hear from him earlier, if you are interested in joining a breakout group to hear more about their work, um, Scott, why don't you tell us a little, just a, a couple minutes on the work that you're doing. Okay, yeah, thank you. Um, uh, my name's Scott Clow. I'm the Environmental Programs Director for the Youth Mountain Youth Tribe. Um, I'm pinch hitting today. I want to make a note of that for uh, Bernadette Cothair, who is our Planning and Development Director here at Youth Mountain. Uh, she couldn't be with you uh, and asked me to, to, to fill in. Um, a little bit about the tribe. Uh, there are about uh, 2,100 enrolled members of the, the tribe. The reservation uh, spans uh, three states around the four corners. So the Colorado corner of the four corners is the main part of the reservation. Little land in northern New Mexico and southeast Utah. There's two communities, the tribal seat in Toyuk, Colorado, and uh, a small community in in White Mesa, Utah. Um, I want to note uh, uh, when Carla Fredericks was uh, talking about a language nest uh, that really hit a chord. The, the tribe uh, started uh, a charter school um, this fall for the first time. The Cuyagot, uh Community uh, School here uh, with a focus on uh, language and culture of the tribe. And, and it's the first um, uh, 
Native American charter school in the history of Colorado. So pretty significant. They really um, want to build on that. Um, uh, relative to climate change um, uh, for the tribe, uh, in addition to wildfire, uh, which is a big issue out here in the West, obviously, um, uh, drought is uh, having a profound impact here. Uh, this tribe is in the upper basin of the Colorado River Basin and uh, has uh, water rights um, as an upper basin entity, federally reserved and also state adjudicated on, on fee lands. Um, and so the, the water impacts are profound here um, and uh, protecting those water rights is really important. Um, a, a couple, um, a couple uh, other things relative to climate change, we're experiencing uh, more and more violent storms uh, as many places around the world are. We're seeing the hundred year storms that were, <laughs> Uh, they're, they're more routine. They're not 100 year intervals. Um, uh, and a lot of the infrastructure is based on a 50 year storm uh, type of design. And uh, we're seeing those, uh, those things happen more often and with destructive uh, consequences. Um, another thing uh, that we work on a lot with climate change is um, uh, species decline and migration from uh, changes in temperature and precipitation here and, and the implications through the Endangered Species Act uh, also. Um, so uh, what we're doing about it. Um, um, and Scott, if I can just stop you there, I think we'd love to have you go more deeply into that in the breakout room. Um, okay. Since we are at 1040, so we're gonna have about 15 minutes. So if you'd like to hear more from Scott about work really being done on the ground, please uh, join group one, group two, and this is all in the chat is wildfire resilience with Jenny from Hewlett. Group three is participatory grant making, working with an intermediary like Native Voices Rising. You'll be with Alistair. Group four is funder collaborative to hear more from Michael. And group five is the international policy with Carla. All right, we hope you all enjoyed your um, conversations and hopefully got some contact information to follow up and deepen those discussions. And just to wrap us up, um, I'm gonna invite the facilitators of the breakout rooms to just share any big thoughts that came out in the chat feature. And then I'll hand it off to Don, and I'm not sure Greg potentially as well, to share some final thoughts about how can folks continue this discussion, get engaged with Native Americans in philanthropy and philanthropy and deepen their work. Yeah, thank you so much, Carrie. We had a really rich conversation, nine of us in, um, in the room with Carla. And I think some of our takeaways were about um, engaging in trust. Um, and I think there was a bumper sticker moment in there that said, uh, that Carla said that if you, if you trust the communities and if you're really listening, then um, you have the answer. Um, what about you, Greg? Yeah, we um, dug more into um, the opportunities for tribes to um, um, get involved more in solar energy and for um, really set a precedent for um, the nation and actually, frankly, the world. So I think, um, Don, we're down to our last minute or two. Um, yeah. So I think for the other moderators, if they could post some of their um, key points in the, uh, the chat box. Yeah. Or maybe their contact information, mm -hmm. because I do know that these conversations are just starting. And if you would like to see more of this uh, kind of event or uh, more discussions like this, um, please do let us know. Um, we are wanting to engage with you around these conversations. Absolutely. And since we're down to our last minute, I'll, I'll try and be really, um, I'll try and do this in 30 seconds. <laughs> um, uh, you all have heard a lot of great information today and advice. And so I just want to extend to you all that on behalf of Native Americans and philanthropy, we're here to help you along this journey. Um, to that point, we've designed a new platform called the Tribal Nations Initiative. And we've launched a national listening tour where we are engaging uh, tribes and tribal communities. Um, there will be a listening session in California um, uh, in February. We're currently working with the Sam Manuel Band of Mission Indians uh, on the final date of that. So um, I posted my uh, email address in the chat. And if you'd like to learn more information about Tribal Nations Initiative, 
um, feel free to reach out to me. Um, you can go to our website and get more information about that as well. But it really is to kind of provide this platform that we're all talking about where we can have better connections, more meaningful relationships, and deploy funds to real needs that exist out there. You know, these are real issues that are impacting our communities. We know that they've been massively underserved for far too many years, and we're, we're here to help you to change that. So I'll let you finish this off, Don. Oh, thank you. That is Native Americans in philanthropy.org slash TNI. Um, and again, thank you to everybody who joined in and everybody who provided such rich uh, discussion and, and lessons. Chiwik Miigwech is uh, thank you in Anishinaabe Moan. So Chiwik Miigwech everyone.